Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome again to the Focal Point Academy Practitioner Series on Workforce Development. Uh, I'm Justin Avery, the Director of Business Development for Academy. Uh, and with me today, I am uh, really excited to have the member of the Focal Point Data Risk family, uh, Mr. Gary McIntyre. Gary is a long-term professional, 20 years plus experience in the development and operation of large security programs in both the public and private sector. He's been an architect, a manager, a consultant. He's worked around the world to build everything from really small to really large enterprise security operation teams. He is the co-author of the Security Operations Center, Building, Operating, and Maintaining Your SOC. And he is also the man who delivered the presentation that he's delivered uh, all across the country that I personally am dying to ask him about called Why Socks Suck. Gary, uh, welcome to Focal Point and thanks for joining me. <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Justin. So, Gary, I think I really want to dive right in with why do socks suck? Well, what's sort of funny is that not all socks suck, but when they suck, they suck really badly. And in general, we're talking about organizations that have struggled probably in some cases for years to sort of build and maintain a SOC. In many cases, they depressurize quite badly because most of the time they fail to meet the expectations that went into their investment in the first place. And a big part of that is that we have tended to spend money in ways that we really didn't understand how we were spending that money and really didn't get the return on investment ultimately that we're hoping out of it. But a lot of it just comes down to not really knowing ultimately what you want the SOC to do, making clear what those expectations are, and then actually being able to deliver to those expectations. Those are those are probably the biggest things. That is, uh, that's an absolutely fantastic point. We get pulled into, on the workforce development side, the, the challenge of throwing money at technology constantly because they don't know how to throw it at anything else. And in your experience in some of the programs that you've built, is that part of that equation of not really defining where things are is kind of the, the technology versus the people side of it? Um, most of the time, it's because the technology that we have tended to invest in, we've tended to believe that it's going to do more for us than, in fact, it can do for us. And the most obvious example where this is really becoming clear in most socks that are being built now is the heavy focus on automation. Where we're mm -hmm. looking for every opportunity we can to identify workflows that can be essentially automated as much as possible or semi-automated end to end. And the, the challenge that we really found is that right from the moment that we're looking at the data that we're consuming to how we're actually analyzing that data to how we're then deciding what to do about it, that it's extremely difficult to, to, to automate really that data end to end that we've struggled with taking the data that we've got and getting much further than, let's say, being able to provide better information ultimately to a talented analyst who's able to then help to decide what to do and then be able to take some actions using some tools that are available. So just as organizations have started really going through that automation sort of exercise, they've discovered that you know maybe 10% of their overall workflows can be fully automated. Maybe, maybe closer to 40% can be somewhat automated, but the entire rest of it's really dependent upon the people, the people that are able to interpret the data that they're being presented with and to be able to essentially come back with a good set of recommended actions that can be taken to deal with a potential intrusion. It's a really, uh, it's a really fascinating angle that that you take with that about, you know, what we get into is we get asked a lot in, in my experience when we go in to talk about developing teams, there is that how much can I take off their plate with automation and this idea of workload and balancing how much of that can be automated versus how much should my team actually be doing, and what we see a lot of is that it's it's because of skills deficits. It's not because of workforce planning. It's because of planning around the gaps that we see in that. When you came to Focal Point just recently, we kind of threw you right into the fire with one of our largest key programs, which obviously we're not allowed to say who it is, but a very large energy sector company that was looking at the challenge of their, their SOC team, which was very large and very diverse, through a series of, of shakeups and reorgs and figuring out who they had and what they could leverage. Could you talk a little bit about the struggles that they were going through and what you saw as you walked through and, and what we were trying to help them do? There's so much to peel off there, but let me take a stab at it. I mean, essentially the challenge is, is that in many cases you have security organizations and let's say it's particularly on the operational side that have been, let's say, very traditionally organized, right? You have a highly specialized job force with specialized job descriptions and specialist teams, but now they're being asked to deliver a set of outcomes based upon a more agile way of approaching delivery. 
where you have a, a much more flexibly defined set of outcomes. You're expecting people to collaborate a great deal more to, to achieve those outcomes, but you're still sort of in these specialist roles. Mm -hmm. And so you get these strange little silos that often happen in such organizations where you have to look at ultimately, how do you help bridge those gaps between them? But you also do have to look at the individuals and, and try to determine, you know, do they have the right mix for me? And, and for me, a mix in a SOC has really become an interesting thing. A lot of the focus in, in the way that we've typically recruited for a SOC is to, let's say, look at folks with particular certifications or very particular sort of uh, experiences that we think we can leverage. And, yeah. and what I've really liked about looking at different sorts of approaches is I sort of realized that a lot of the, the things I really need out of a SOC are people that fit well together, that collaborate well together, that are able to solve problems together, that may have a, a good set of knowledge, skills, and abilities, that trifecta that the NICE framework likes to call on, that difference between what you know being the knowledge, the skill being what you can do, and the ability, your ability to actually perform those skills with the knowledge that you've got. That I'm looking for individuals with those knowledge, skills, and abilities, but I'm also looking for people that actually fit really well together. And in many cases, I'm willing to sacrifice in a SOC people that fit well together more than they might have, at least at the beginning, a really strong set of knowledge, skills, and abilities. So recruiting people that fit well with the team, that have a native set of, of skills and the enthusiasm required to become better at the job is really a key part of basically how, how a SOC can be more successful, particularly from the people side. Yeah. You also talked a little, a little bit about the technology, and I just wanted to sort of yeah. mention something about that technology part of it, is that we tend to think of technology and automation as replacing essentially you know, what people do as an activity. And that's not always the best focus when you're looking at it from a workforce development sort of perspective. What we found is that the more that you can think of the technology as either assisting somebody to their job better, meaning let's say more consistently or with a higher degree of fidelity, uh, let's say more success in determining what's going on inside of the environment. That's actually gonna be more important, but also looking at trying to remove boring parts of their job. This is not often the thing that we're focused on as much with automation, but it's extremely important in workforce development within a SOC is to remove as much of the boring stuff as possible so that ultimately people's brains are more engaged on the real problems to solve particularly when they're lacking the data to really obviously see what's going on. That's an interesting point that you make there because we obviously, and as you know, and, and maybe our listeners don't, one of the things that we get pulled into most often is kind of counterintuitive. When you first get into workforce development for security operations centers, which is what we do, obviously, there's this idea that it's going to be the, the people that have been in there for 20 years that they're going to want to focus on. How do I make these rock stars rock more? And really what we get pulled into is this hodgepodge of level one, level two resources that have kind of come from this traditional recruiting model of they had this many certs and this many degrees and things they had done as a good starting point. And then you get them all in there. And because they, they come from such kind of hodgepodge backgrounds, they really can't perform together. They don't fit together in any sort of, of linear way. Uh, is, is that kind of what you're describing? Yeah, I mean, in general, one of the things I work with with a lot of organizations is improving their really their front end of recruitment and trying to avoid what I sometimes call checkbox recruitment. You only look at candidates that have a particular certification for a particular job instead of evaluating them more carefully on whether or not they have really the knowledge, the skills and the abilities that are really gonna be applicable in the job you're expecting of them but also that they have the right softer skills yeah. that are gonna fit well with the rest of the team. Do they collaborate well? Do they communicate well? Do they seem to fit emotionally with the rest of the team that has to deliver? But I can't underemphasize how important those communication collaboration skills are, particularly since one of the biggest reasons why socks tend to suck is that executives who've spent a lot of money on them don't feel they're getting the value out of them that they're expecting. And a lot of that value is achieved by just being able to talk to those executives and that leadership that's essentially your primary stakeholders and to be able to describe the value that in fact you're providing to them and to be able to directly provide value to them. It's, it's, a, it's a huge thing. That, that's actually a fantastic point. I don't think I've ever quite thought about it that way of, you know, there's, there's the performance issue, but then there's also the perception on the front end of if I hire for this role, I'm going to get this out of it. And what we see happen is it's hard to find that role. So you take the next closest thing. And of course, you start to degrade away or kind of chip away at that overall expectation, which becomes almost hard to, to develop those people because you don't really know what you've got. 
So how do people get better at this? I mean, when you talk to people about doing a better job of recruiting and, and the people piece of this, right? What do you think is are, are some of those key indicators, key skill sets that people should be looking for, or not even skill sets, abilities or natural tendencies? You know, we've talked a little bit about this, and I think you have some fascinating insights on what type of people should be involved in security. In general, I mean, especially in a SOC, what sort of makes the work a little bit interesting is that it's essentially always dealing with uncertainty. And I, I often separate for my for my customers between, let's say, risk and uncertainty, where risk, often you don't necessarily know what's going to happen, but you have enough data to be able to figure out what's the probability of something occurring. Whereas uncertainty is really about where you lack a, a large amount of data and yet are still expected to make some sort of decision. And inside of a SOC, if it hasn't been automated, it usually means that you actually have a really uncertain situation mm -hmm. where you're missing a large amount of data. So I'm actually looking for people that have typically the ability to solve problems when major parts of the data are really unavailable to them or where that data slowly emerges over time and they have to not be so stuck in their earlier hypotheses, let's say, but have to evolve as the data that they have available also evolves. So this is a huge part about what we spend time on is to think of SOC people particularly as being people that I expect to be really good predictors, really good people that are able to work with limited data and still come up with some conclusions. So we've had customers that have hired people into SOCs less with, let's say, security skills, but oddly enough with things that are interesting skills that are useful in solving problems, like linguistics, or the ability to understand multiple languages generally as a, as a fluent speaker in more than one language, or folks that, for example, work in archeology, span or anthropology, areas where they have inherently limited data sets but are expected to ultimately draw some conclusion and to be able to describe those conclusions to an audience that may not be an expert in their field, right? So I'm looking for those people typically that have that enthusiasm and interest, but also that native problem solving capability. And, and the reason why I started focusing on this was actually because of some historical examples we've had for example, early cryptographers before we had sort of professional cryptographic development, where essentially they would, in World War II, recruit people into Bletchley Park, for example, that were just really good at solving crossword puzzles. Mm -hmm. These are people that just can solve problems. And that's ultimately what I'm looking for. I'm looking for people that solve problems. But also, I'm looking for people that recognize that they don't generally get it right as an individual that they're always going to be better at solving problems or figuring out what's going on by working together as part of a team. Yeah. So that sort of goes then past the recruitment and now into that development side, which is really more about developing as the team than let's say as individuals. And this has always been the problem I would say with certifications has been that is really focused on an individual's development and an individual's let's say capabilities. Whereas I'm primarily interested in the development of those capabilities within a team structure. That's been one of the biggest reasons why I decided to come over to Focal Point was that that was really the focus and the philosophy of, of the way that, that Focal Point approached that development problem. Yeah, you, you actually read my mind because that was what I wanted to ask you next. You know, with all of this background that you have, it's interesting. Our first interview was with Drew Simonis at HPE. He was kind enough to spend some time with us and talked a lot about our philosophy and our methodology that made him want to work with us. It's interesting to have you as our second interview as somebody who who came to join our team. What was it that attracted you to Focal Point? I'm curious, you know, if you could just kind of give me a couple of your thoughts on with your resume, your background, you, you've probably seen a lot of great business models, a lot of bad ones, a lot of good value props, a lot of bad ones. What is it about the Focal Point piece of how we do what we do that said to you, I want to work with that guy? I mean, a large part of it was, frankly, the focus on developing the cyber workforce that mm -hmm. I've always seen sort of the the main reason why SOCs are excellent or the main reasons why SOCs tend to underperform is less around, let's say, a huge amount of technology investment or a, a huge, let's say, focus on process. In fact, it's it's in most cases going to be on the people as to why a SOC is going to be awesome. And, and it's funny when I go into SOCs that are awesome or into their many variants, which I'll talk about here in a moment is that in general, it's the people that make or break it. And the fact that Focal Point really focuses on developing people was the main reason, obviously, why I came over. It was a self-serving question, but I certainly appreciate that answer. Gary, last question for you that I have. I've been in a lot of these meetings with you. We've talked a lot about this, and, and people kind of look at improving their stock 
in your experience, if I was going to say to somebody, hey, top three things that you should be looking at to make small steps that have big dividends that pay off when you're trying to improve your performance of your team, what are the things that are top of mind for you? I would say probably the 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 sort of base place to start is really around what are you even going to name the SOC is actually really sort of important because the name conveys to most of the typical business stakeholders what they can expect of it. Yep. And it's those expectations which are probably the first thing to manage. So if you call a SOC a SOC, for example, a Security Operations Center, there's an immediate sort of mental image that most people get of a a, a room with a bunch of monitors on one end and tiered seating and people quietly and, and studiously working through the various problems that, that might be facing them, but ultimately managing technology and managing the view of the data from those big screens. That is sort of a traditional way of looking at it, but also an appropriate way of looking at SOX, particularly if you have a stakeholder who came from a physical security background and is familiar with alarm monitoring centers that are very similarly set up to a traditional SOC. But if you also promise that you're going to do something like a cyber defense center, that mm -hmm. word defense means a huge amount to people. Yeah. Uh, and if you are unable to defend, that's going to be a big, big no-no. You have to have the ability not only to see bad things and to be successful at seeing bad things, but you'd also have to have the ability to take action. So a lot of customers tend to focus on, let's say, one of three other sorts of names that, that often come up in, in naming a SOC. They'll sometimes call it, for example, a security intelligence center or a cybersecurity intelligence center. I like that name a lot because it does convey quite accurately that really what a SOC is about is, is producing intelligence. It's about taking incomplete data, possibly even contradictory data, and to be able to produce the answer to a particular question, let's say, like, is there something bad going on? And if so, what? And to be able to generate an answer with some degree of confidence. It's, it really is an intelligence production that I'm expecting them to do. So that's the first name. The yeah. second name is a fusion center, sometimes a little bit of an overused sort of term, but a fusion center implies in the way that they were designed and thought of is that not only do you have folks, let's say from the IT organization or from the security organization in the room, you also have the business in the room that together you actually deliver to the mission. And that is a key part of what makes a fusion center a fusion center is that continuous and almost instantaneous collaboration between the different parts of the business. The last name that I see quite frequently, and it's probably the most innocuous, and that's the reason why a lot of people choose it, is something like a cybersecurity center. Yep. It doesn't have a lot of meaning. It doesn't convey a lot of expectations, which is the reason why a lot of people choose it. <laughs> but frankly, a lot of this comes down to, can I just come up with a reasonable set of desired outcomes that I want to achieve? And so a lot of customers I work with, we sit down and very basically start going through, okay, who are your stakeholders? Can we can we figure out who who does have the power and interest to drive the way you're going to develop and who you have to please? Can we come up with a name that sort of makes sense? But also, can we define a vision, a long-term aspirational vision, as well as a shorter term set of missions that you think you can achieve to and be successful to. So I would say that's usually the the first of, of the things that I typically focus on. You know, it's something you would never ever think about, right? Just how big a deal it is to name something. It, it's so simple, it's brilliant. So the name is the first one, Gary, that's a, that's a great point. What is uh, the second thing that you would impart to people that are looking to take uh, small but important steps to overall improvements? Well, usually the second thing is once you've figured out sort of what the expectations are, it's to figure out, well, what does the SOC actually do? What, what services it is actually going to have to provide? And how is it going to provide those services? That decision around delivery is probably going to be the second most important. And a lot of the, the sort of common mistakes that we've made in the past around, around it is, first of all, not defining those services very well and making it so that the what is going to be delivered is clear both upwards towards the, the stakeholders, as well as downwards towards the folks that are ultimately gonna deliver it. But the second thing that we've often found is a mistake is that oftentimes people tend to think of, well, you know, if the work is simple and straightforward and sort of stupid, we'll just get an outsourcer to do that. We'll just get somebody else to do that work. I have no problem with getting outsourcers to do work, either on the simpler end of things or the repetitive end of things, where frankly also automation can be powerful, but also on the high end of things where we might need an extremely rare but infrequently used skill set. But the thing that's often missed, particularly from a cyber workforce development perspective, is that sometimes simpler work is a way to develop people's knowledge, skill, and ability on the job. 
And removing that as an ability, removing that opportunity to learn that way is often a mistake. It means that you have to then focus on recruiting much more advanced resources from, in some cases, very difficult markets, because you're not able to develop as easily internally using, let's say, on-the-job experiential learning and, and learning as you go. So I would say that's probably the second thing. And then what's the third? I would say probably the third one is then deciding ultimately if you've got the right people, if you understand what they have to deliver, what are the supports that are going to be required to basically deliver? And I, I think of supports as both being the process and the technology parts of it. One of the classic mistakes from the process perspective is just simply having too much process. We've sort of fallen into this strange little trap where when we talk about maturity and particularly things based upon the capability maturity models out there, is that we think that the more mature we can make the process, the more consistently we can deliver it, or the more we can deliver it across multiple people in the same sort of way, basically, that it's gonna somehow make the SOC better. And it's sort of turned out in most cases, that's not true. Mm -hmm. That in, unless I need something to be consistent, I want the flexibility to still be there. Because in many cases, we're dealing with an uncertain set of data to try to figure out what's going on. We need a lot of flexibility to figure out what's, what's happening. And robbing the people in the SOC of that flexibility through rigorous process is sometimes a mistake. But on the technology side, again, as a support, is to think of where the center of gravity for a SOC tends to be. And, and traditionally, the center of gravity for a SOC has tended to be in the SIM, in a security information and event management system. But what we're starting to realize is that the real center of gravity for most SOCs is actually the case management system, or sometimes referred to as a, as a security orchestration automation and response solution, a, a SOAR nowadays. But it's the case management function particularly that is the center of gravity. It's that we have found it about something that's of interest. We're gonna bring it to the attention of the team that has to investigate. The case management so solution is really what allows them to actually collect the necessary information that they're actually collecting during an investigation, analyze that data and produce some result. And that ultimately is the center of gravity. The SIM itself is actually just essentially a security data analytics platform amongst many other security data analytics platforms inside of most enterprises that can either generate data to help trigger such investigations or to help support such investigations. But thinking of the SIM, for example, as the center of gravity is usually a common mistake. Whereas the workflow and enablement inside of the case management solution is often a much more important place to focus. That's, that's another great point. I appreciate that. Those are three great points. Gary, any final thoughts you want to leave us with about your past coming into to focal point or some of the work that you've seen or, or just in general observations about the market you'd like to, to share with me before we uh, wrap up? The one thing I'd wrap up on is to always go back to those outcomes always, that are desired for a SOC to be able to deliver. And a lot of the rest of it sort of flows from those outcomes, from the definition of what ultimately the SOC or let's say defensive cyber operations more, more generally has to deliver. And mm -hmm. if people can start there, that's often going to be the best place for them to start to develop a SOC that ultimately over time is less fragile and will typically survive over and deliver successfully over a longer period of time. Gary, thanks so much for those observations, and thank you for spending time with us today talking about your views on workforce development, as well as just SOC and security in general. I certainly appreciate it. My pleasure, Dustin. Uh, and thanks, everybody. We will be continuing shortly with another installment in our practitioner series on workforce development. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.